Hi everyone, today I'll be sharing with you about what we do at Hallmask regarding information extraction from clinical notes. My name is Wei Jing. Today's content will be split into three parts, namely to first share with you more about the motivations behind building this information extraction or IE model. Then I'll show you about the NLP model pipeline and lastly talk about some of the results and limitations of this model. Firstly, diving into the motivations for developing this IE model. Hospitals face a very high re patient readmission rates, and this is costly for both the patients and hospitals. Now, how can we reduce patient readmission rates to improve patient outcomes? This can be done by tapping on a huge database of information called the clinical note. And by extracting information from this clinical note, we are able to do some downstream analytics, such as by predicting the readmission risk of patients. For IE models right now, there are some challenges that we face in building these models. So taking the IE, taking a clinical note as an input to the model, uh, and note that this clinical note is in an unstructured format. We'll use some rule-based and ML models and then output a clinician assessment of the patient in a structured format. And some of these challenges regarding using rule-based and ML models would be that it might not be as exhaustive in nature, given that we have a large domain of text and it's very specific to the clinical domain, this using rule-based techniques might not be the best. Next, we also identify that there are various clinical domains and these domains might be very specific. At Holmas, we are interested in the behavioral health space, namely the psychiatry notes. And with these psychiatry data, we have even more vocabulary that is very specific to this clinical domain. Lastly, we also have some region-specific information whereby different clinics around the countries might have different ways they do diagnosis on the patients. By using such rule-based and ML models, it might not be very scalable across different clinics and even countries. Thus, this motivated us for building an IE model. This is a sample clinical note that we can see. And what are some of the output information that we desire? We want to identify the various topics and information such as the diagnosis, what's the mental status examination, some prior hospitalization, or even social history information in the clinical note. So to give you an a um, more illustration, we'll see that putting a clinical note through the NLP model, we want to identify the topic. So it can be diagnosis, and then we want to identify the particular label, for example, psychosis. And then there might be some contextual information regarding this label. It can be whether the label is present or not. So that's a negation context, whether it's a current information or historical information. And lastly, about assertion. So it can be that the information in the clinical note is not associated with the patient. Maybe it's the patient's family members. And thus, we want to add in this contextual information to better understand what's the patient assessment. And to give you some context, the number of labels that we are looking at, it's in this box, nine topics, 86 mental status examination or MSE labels and 71 social history labels. Moving on to the NLP pipeline and model training process. The whole model was developed in this way. First, we get our data from the shape database. We develop a set of labels and then we manually tag these sentences with our developed labels. Then we train the model. So 
putting in a sentence, we can use either deep learning model or rule-based model and output some topic labels of this sentence. And then we'll evaluate them on a whole outset. And in today's sharing, we'll focus more on the deep learning model that we use in this process. The deep learning model we use is called BERT, which is very powerful state-of-the-art model. It's able to understand context information very well. And this is because it's being pre-trained on a huge amount of corpus. And this, after building this BERT pre-trained model, we are able to fine-tune it on various NLP tasks without major changes to the model architecture. And this means that we can use the BERT model for many NLP tasks, including information extraction. So with pre-trained models, you might ask what sort of text was this BERT trained on? It was trained on Wikipedia corpus. And with that, you might also think, what if it's trained on other types of data? And indeed, BERT was trained on various types of data, we have various variants, such as BioBert and Bioclinical Bert, which was additionally trained on more clinical data sets. And with these many variants, we want to identify which variant would be the most suitable for our use case. What we did was to use the mass language modeling task, where it's sort of a few in the blank kind of task, Given the sentence with some words must, we want to identify what are the possible words that were must. And to evaluate the performance on, of this MLM training task, we can use the accuracy score. For our use case, what we did was to modify the accuracy slightly to take into context some similar words. So for example, depression and anxiety might have similar meaning and might not be very important in our use case. We just want to identify whether the BERT model is able to understand the information and does not need to predict the exact work. So by making this metric more linear, we are able to take into account more words. After trying out BERT, BioBERT and Bioclinical BERT, Bioclinical birds give us the best accuracy score, and that's what we are going to use for our model. As for the model architecture, after we put a document through BERT, we are interested in being able to classify the sentences. And this is done by taking the output of the 12th or last encoder of BERT. And then we'll build dense layers by using either the CLS tokens or all the tokens as input to these dense layers. As with all deep learning tasks, we're also interested with the loss calculation. And for our use case, we created a loss that takes into account both the labels and the contextual labels. For the labels itself, we will first take the binary cross entropy loss and then we'll include some positive sample weighting, meaning that the labels with that are present would be weighted more than the labels that were not present. And this is very important because out of, let's say, 86 MSE labels that we have, one sentence might include two to three labels only and it's a very sparse data set. So we will need to weight this positive sample more. Then we'll also take into consideration a sample weighting whereby we want to weigh out the classes that have the least number of sentences. And this is to balance the imbalance in the number of sentences across various labels. Lastly, for the context labels, we'll also add an additional loss, which is masking, where we want to only count the loss for where a label is present. 
As for the model training process, what we did was to use the Hugging Face Transformers library. It's a very powerful library which enables us to code both in TensorFlow and PyTorch. Then we used the AWS EC2 instance because it was very difficult to train on CPU, or rather it takes a long time to be able to train BERT model with many, many hyperparameters. Lastly, we optimized the hyperparameters that we're tuning on the classification layers. And to do it in a more effective way, we look at the Bayesian optimization technique. To evaluate the performance of our models, we use the recall score as the main performance metric. And this was because it's costly to make a wrong diagnosis. We also added a K4 cross-validation technique when we are training our model. And this is because for the MSE and social history data, we have very small sample sizes across some of the labels. And splitting into three set data sets, train validation and test, would mean that some sets would have very low samples. And what we did was to do a K4 cross-validation where it's split into three data sets and three models were trained on each set. Then we'll take the validation for each set and evaluate to find the performance of our model. For the contextual labels, we also did a separate evaluation technique where we consider the label and the contextual label. For example, when we want to understand the I want to understand the performance of our negation label. We have the targets of whether it's present or absent. And these would be one of the confusion matrix that we created to understand how to calculate the negation scores. And one important thing to note is that it, there doesn't exist a 0, 1 label because if the label doesn't exist, then we can't have a negation for that label that doesn't exist. Yeah. Moving on to the last part on the results and limitations of our model. This is the best results we have so far. And we are still in the midst of developing various models. So yeah, take this with a pinch of salt and we hope that we can share with you better results in the future. Some of the limitations that we have while develop this, developing these models was the potentiality of the inefficient processing of the model because this model, bird model we use is very large and there are many classification tasks that we're trying to do. So we are trying to predict the topic, the MSE, the social history, and with so many tasks and so many models, adding them up together, it can be quite some time before we are able to predict the results. Next would be that the data set might not be very representative. For us, what we did was to manually label this data set. And because we have many different people labeling it, although they might have undergone some medical training, they might not be labeling some of the sen sentences the same way. And what we did was to conduct an inter-rater assessment on this clinician's annotation. And lastly, that there may be some new categories and labels in the current data set that might not appear in other data sets. So this means that by, by tailoring the list of labels to our current data set, we might miss out on other labels where the data is not present. So this marks the end of my sharing. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Maybe share, remove your, your slides so that you can see the question. I can see it, don't worry. Okay, see it. okay so cool. For us, we use yep. various uh, metrics, including uh, recall precision, but the main metric that we were looking at was the recall score. And this is because we want to be able to know 
whether it's the model is predicting uh, the the predicted result is true or not, right? And if it's it's more costly if there's a wrong diagnosis being predicted. That's why we focus on the recall score. Okay, cool. Yeah, so there's a comment from Leonard, uh, very clear, even from point of view of a non-technical person. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Leonard. Thanks, thanks for the comment. And then um, yeah, well, maybe we have a next question. Yeah. So what uh accuracy may oh sorry, how would predicting the labels help uh in reducing the re uh, emission rates? Sure, thank you for your question. I can share with you a slide that I have. So after uh, what we did was to put the notes through the model and this note represent one visit by the patient to the clinic. And we hope that by identifying the various labels present throughout various time points, meaning various clinic visits, we are able to do some modeling techniques that would be able to identify what's the risk of a patient. I hope that answers the question. Okay, okay, cool. And then uh, we have one last question um, for you. Yeah. So were there any challenges uh, faced in uh, pre-processing the data in the pipeline prior to breaking them into uh, sentences? For us, there was not many challenges in that because our data is rather clean. Uh, I would Oh, okay. One thing that I remember is that uh, when we're trying to tag the sentences, basically we need to split the notes into uh, single sentences, right? And when we use existing uh, tokenization techniques like NLTK, it somehow would split uh, various numbers. So for example, uh, in the note, we have like uh, number one, this was the medication, number two was the second medication. And the NLTK would split one and the medication. So it means that it's supposed to belong to a same sentence, but because of uh, what existing techniques that we use, it's, it was split into two sentences. Yeah, so what we did was to uh, do some manual process where we have to uh, like stick back the, the the numbers and the associated sentence together and then we'll unspeak them after it's being tokenized. Yeah, so these are some of the things that we did. <laughs>